Okay. Well, I hope there was uh, enough there that was kind of interesting and you could pick out of relevance today. Obviously, there's quite a few awkward moments there as well, and I'm sure we'll talk about those too. Um, so, <coughs> in a way, uh, what I'd like to do is this is a sort of, we're all going to get involved here, but I'd quite like to sort of connect all of this to, to now. And as a journalist, this was my journey quite a long time ago going to all of these revolutionary groups, <coughs> talking to them, finding out <coughs> how they had used this work, not just Gene Sharp's work, but, but other work. Um, because it always seemed to me that whenever d revolutions were discussed, that they were always discussed in, um, in isolation. So we would talk about Venezuela, we would talk about Tiananmen, and there wouldn't be any talk of outside influences. It, w it was all spontaneous. This just happened, you know. People just got a notion and they just went out and they did it, and they didn't take influence from anywhere else. So part of what I wanted to do with this film was sort of map how organisations learned from each other. And there was a really nice element there where you saw the Sudanese Garifna having learned from that Oppor um, video, which I think is one of my favourite parts of the film. So over to you guys. How has Gene Sharp been useful to you? How did you find it? And, and what do you think it's done to sort of change how Extinction Rebellion are? Uh, first of all, thank you for this showing. That was um, an incredibly uh, interesting and um, stimulating and activating film. Um, so thank you for your work. Um, so yes, Gene Sharp's influence on the uh, strategy of uh, Extinction Rebellion. Um, I think it's really clear that, um, well, uh, our founders began this journey with a, a desire to bring love back into the world. And it really does come down to that, I think. Um, when you look at the theories of nonviolent um, uh, protest, and particularly the 198 <coughs> nonviolent weapons. Um, those are the absolute lifeblood of Extinction Rebellion. Um, you can see them through everything that we do. Um, even, you know, you start with protest and persuasion and um, flags, banners, you know, we've got this humility, empathy, frugality, rings through all of the things that we do. Uh, Rebel for Life is over all of the front of our protests. Um, you know, it's, it's this sort of bringing the, the life and the, the joy into, um, into resistance. Um, painting things, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially bringing this creativity back. Um, it's something that we feel has probably been taken away in a kind of, you know, very fast moving consumerist culture. Um, so you kind of start at that, that point. And then we move into um, economic non-cooperation and economic boycott. Um, Extinction Rebellion has many, many arms. Um, recently we've done the Extinction Rebellion fashion boycott um, and uh, the social non-cooperation of striking. I mean, that's essentially what we've been asking people to do when they come down to the rebellions. Right. Because a lot of people kind of, they sort of miss this part. And this is what often what I hear from people that Gene mm. Sharp gives them. It's this idea of, you know, they go out on the street and you do a protest. And we all saw that with sort of the protests against the Iraq war. And there were a mil million people in the street. And they came back and they said, but why didn't it do anything? We, we had a million people in the street. And when you look at Gene Sharp's 198 uh, non-violent weapons, what you see is sort of the march is one of them. And I think that was one of the first gifts. He said, no, look, if you're only going out in the streets and protesting, then you are missing all this other stuff. And actually, the most powerful things, the most powerful weapons aren't the going out in the street and wearing banners, although that's really important to <coughs> raise awareness and spread the knowledge. But it's actually the stuff that really affects the, those pillars of support he talks about, economic intervention. Um, <coughs> Blockade is one of them, which really Extinction Rebellion has become known from. And unless you actually make people feel uncomfortable or you change a view, um, then you're not you're not shifting. And, and that seems to me to be something that we're seeing from Extinction Rebellion. It goes beyond mere protest, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I think just um, finishing on from that, it is um, exactly, it's it's the um, disruptive tactics, um, finding the places where people are going about business as usual, which is essentially what is continuing this cycle of destruction, um, bringing the protest into those spaces where people are surprised, essentially. I mean, I don't know how many people here were um, out in April. Um, can we get a church of hands? Nice. Yeah, over here. Wonderful. Um, and was anyone here kind of pissed off by us? That's lovely. I suppose you wouldn't be here watching this <laughs> if you were. Um, but I think a lot of people were, and I think it's an interesting um, shift. We spoke to a lot of people on the streets who were immediately pissed off and angry. So they're like, why are you stopping me going to work? And then we would have teach-ins. Um, for example, George Monbiot did a talk um, at uh, Marble Arch. Um, there were lots of mini teachings going on around Oxford Circus. People joined those teachings to kind of learn what we were about. And I had people coming up to me saying, this really annoyed me yesterday, but I've just sat in a teaching and I kind of get what you're about now. Where can I sign up? And it was just this kind of slow movement towards, um, yeah, believing in what we were doing. Okay, so I'm going to test you a bit now. Um, Roger and others in the, in the leadership have said, you know, actually the, the power comes from Not the leadership. arrests. Okay, so... Decentralised socio sociopathic okay. Well, we've come to that. Because <laughs> I, would, I would say, um, uh, I, don't, I sort of come across all these groups and they say, oh, we're, we're really decentralised, like the Serbs did to Bob Pelvey, and he said, bullshit. You know, I didn't come off, I didn't come off a banana boat. So I didn't come off a banana boat. Who's the, who is the leader? I was being slightly ironic in my answer. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, so yeah. so there's a leadership. There is. You can answer that one. I've talked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Um, there isn't. No, I, I, I genuinely, I, I, we strongly are a leader-full movement, not a leaderless movement. Um, mm -hmm. No, there are founders, there are influential ideas, but there is uh, an incredibly healthy uh, and at times uh, emotive and at other times very painful forum of discussion going on uh, in XR in almost every single meeting that we have. Okay, so let's go back to this idea of um, uh, power, so of blockade, which seems to be the main... Uh, tactic at the moment versus support throughout the country. Now, one of the Serbs created what he called a, sort of a power graph, and literally, it's it's a it's a, just a very simple graph against an axis against sort of events that happen over time. So, one of those things could be, you know, we've just um, we've just unco uncovered voter fraud, and and then your your support goes up, so they plot it quite high. You know, this is it's, it, it's like election polling. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it could be one of your activists is videoed, you know, kicking the shit out of a policeman, and then your support goes down, right? And the the game generally is to get that support rising across all sectors of society, um, continuous, continuously or pretty much rising. What do you think the drone strike announcement did to your popularity? Um, yeah, so there's a particularly interesting um, moment in our uh, usage of a tactic which is to widen the scale of available action that there is to an individual to take action. Now, before Extinction Rebellion, uh, it came into force and existed. I think we can be fairly um, safe in saying that the difference between doing absolutely nothing to the environmental crisis and doing what we were told was the most we could do, i.e. recycling, maybe eating less meat, signing a few petitions, it was about this big. And to be honest, all of us sensed right, it literally didn't matter if we took a load of flights and if we ate a load of meat and we didn't recycle. Because honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it didn't really make much difference. Now, when you bring civil disobedience into this, suddenly that scale widens massively. And now the scale changes because the, at this end, you've got maybe helping uh, in the back office, you've got doing sustenance and food, helping organize. And then at this end up over here, you've say got uh, being arrested and spending a night in a prison cell. And at this end over here, you've got climbing on a DLR train and you've got going to prison as well. Now, I personally am not um, going to be flying drones at Heathrow. It's not an extinction rebellion action anymore. But the theory, from a gene chart point of view, would be that throwing drones at Heathrow, a peaceful, non-violent action, moves up onto this scale over here. And what happens generally to people in a movement that we're finding already is they naturally progress through in this direction. And so right now, I was arrested and uh, 
uh, in April. I'm planning to go to prison for a month or two uh, at the next rebellion in October. It's a natural progression upwards in that direction that seems to work in a kind of natural and organic way. So my, so my, um, I, I, I can't, I, of course, speak for Jean, but I would, I, I can imagine what he might say, and it's, do you think um, your arrest sort of swelled support because of what you did, or is it because, um, or, or does it have to be because that arrest is unjustified? So does the political jujitsu work because you're unfairly arrested, or is it, is it taken away because, for instance, you might be glued to a tube train and there's sort of therefore there's a different classification of arrest mm. unfair arrest mm. which swells the support behind you because it's unfair and people come to it and then some that say well actually you know fair enough fair one as a cop yeah. you know. well I mean this is uh, goes down to the, the nuts and bolts of it really and what we've got from Sergey in particular is the idea of creating what's called a dilemma action for the police um, in every single thing we do we try to be disruptive as you know that's the only way we're going to uh, win the game we try to show sacrifice so our bodies are physically on the line we're not just sitting there doing petition or speaking about this we're, we're showing personally we're willing to make sacrifice with our time with getting a criminal record sacrificing our job potential sacrificing our families thinking we're morons and so forth and then of course we're very respectful Phil as well and we're hugely respectful to the police as well so the dilemma action that we uh, will be doing again in October only now with exponentially more forces is to put plug to be <laughs> October the 7th 10 a.m. Uh, if you could be there um, <laughs> is that we, we are going to indeed be finding that sweet spot where we are doing something perfectly reasonable we're standing our ground we're holding space with blockades and we are challenging the authorities and we're challenging the authorities to say if you need to arrest 10,000 grandmas professionals doctors children and everything in between then the law that you are arresting them on does not make sense and this is where we come into so it's absolutely crucial that we do show that we are winning that public support in that way so one of the most impressive things that i've seen probably everyone else is um Sergio says in the film you know mass actions are incredibly difficult to coordinate and yet extinction rebellion has done that and actually with very very little violence how have you, how have you managed to get so many people with fringes that would quite happily break windows and just take away your media sort of friend you know friendly activity there how have you managed to do that because that, that is that was a huge job surely i really believe that there's something in the air at the moment I think that we're starting to feel that change needs to happen. Um, I think Extinction Rebellion is another conduit for that that energy, that desire for change. Um, so that is definitely a huge part of it. Um, we had the school strikes. We've had Greta. You know, there there have been a lot of different conduits of this of this feeling of un uncertainty and, um, yeah, uh, genuine worry and fear. And you know, it's been paired with the information from the IPCC report back in October. Um, obviously, we've got the example of the Amazon. Now we've got the reports of the methane being very very caught in. Um, under the ice, um, you know, in the ice caps. And we know all of this stuff. There's a rising uncertainty. And I think um, one of the most powerful things that we have as a movement, um, well, the most powerful thing we have is the people. And the most powerful thing that we have as people is uh, recognising when other people are doing something that we kind of thought we kind of wanted to do, but weren't quite sure whether it was okay. And more and more people are coming out thinking, no, I'm unhappy with the way that the government is dealing with the climate emergency. Um, I don't think that my kids' futures are safe. I don't think that my personal future is safe. Um, oh, someone else is getting, you know, have, there's, a, there's a channel through which I can communicate this um, unrest. So it's a combination of this rising energy of... of becoming incredibly unsettled the media communication little as it has been but it's getting better of the complete climate breakdown disaster that we're experiencing at the moment and the combination of those two things are, are really coming together um, from an organizational perspective I suppose that's the third prong really um, we have a talk called heading for extinction and what to do about it I don't know if you've seen it wonderful um, it's not actually that wonderful it's um, terrifying and deeply moving. Um, uh, how did you find it? Yeah, it's inspiring. 
Great. But I wanted something to do. I wanted you to okay. give me something to do. Did you find that at that point? A little bit. Mm. I guess I guess one of the things, and then it was the last thing I was going to say before mm. throwing over, over to these guys, um, to, is that um, there's a little bit in the book, actually, the... Um, this is uh, not a drill, but which I'm sure second you've all shameless plug. See. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not profiting from it. Um, so uh, there's something in that that says you've got to go to the capital city, and that sort of sort of sort of sets something off in me. I thought well, this is a bit this is a bit London centric, is it? Because I'm from Inverness, I'm from a, a remote and rural community, and I read that and I thought, you know, I'm not sure you do because actually what Jean would say is. Yeah, for an economic intervention, there are many countries will say, for instance, in Egypt, the, the biggest thing that affected, one of the biggest things that affected um, uh, the government there was the textile strike. And that, that happened in the regions. And this would have been the same if we, you know, we'd had a strike in some of the, the, mini, the mining towns. This, that, that happened in Serbia as well. Actually, that cut the electricity. These are the, these are the, the serious non-violent interventions that we're talking about, not just the protest. If the people walk out of your power stations, you don't have power, and the police don't respond, you 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 can do that as a non-violent movement. That's incredibly powerful. That's not weak at all. Um, but the rest of the country is very important, and perhaps they might feel alienated by the fact that you're saying, well, actually, the rest of the country doesn't doesn't have an impact on this. You've got to go to London. Um, well, obviously. One thing that's absolutely crucial to note here is that we're still in a movement building phase of our action. And as such, um, you know, being where the media is, being where the power is, and being where the spotlight is most naturally is the place to be. This is partly to our dilemma action design that the pillar of power that we're trying to shape right now is the police. And the way to do that is with maximising that chance of peaceful, non-violent arrest. So to do that, you need a lot of people all in the same place as well. But we're also crucially, narrative-wise, putting the spotlight where it is. So in terms of atomization, as Gene Sharp points out, we all of us right here have been atomized for an awful long time. The government has known for 30 years, and it's known the science for at least 50, but it's known for 30 years where we're heading. And in those 30 years, more than half of the carbon emissions ever created have been pumped into the atmosphere. So no longer do we need to be told that we as private consumers are the problem here. We need to be going to the government because the government are the ones with the power. The government is the one driving us to extinction. And if a government is taking us to extinction, in my opinion, it's no longer a legitimate government. And so there is a really strong argument for that. Caveat though, that we're still in a movement building phase. And so should we look at those kind of economic disruption tactics of which you speak? And we had some very exciting ideas from Greenpeace the other day, which we like, can't wait to tell you about. Oh, sorry. But um, that's something that we'll, we'll get to, obviously, when there is the power across the nation as well. And at the moment, we have to be completely honest, sadly, part of our job is to raise the alarm and to share the science, because the scientists have not been able to communicate that. And so we're still the canaries in the mine bit at this moment. Um. Can I, can I just add on to that, that um, that is totally central to our uh, tactics for the rebellions. But we are actually now in 69 cities, I th uh, sorry, 69 places in the UK, and we have local groups. And the way that we're structured is that you can learn from your local group. Over 200 <laughs> local groups now, actually. Is local. it? Yeah, yeah. Blimey. Should check. Um, uh, so it's over 200 local groups now, um, and they operate completely independently, having seen a sort of blueprint for a working group for a legal team and an actions team and a media team and then all coming together to create actions where they are. And part of that is, again, it's the people power, it's the community building and it's creating this kind of um, space for understanding and essentially sharing of grief because like, quite frankly, we're, we're really fucked and it's really quite scary when you go into the like details of it. And I, one of the most important things about those 200 groups um, and people building up across the country in this kind of like mycelium kind of, kind of idea um, is that 20, 30 years down the line, things are going to be incredibly different to how they are now. We, we, we don't know what they're going to be like, um, but uh, th th it's, it's going to be almost... The comp I, I actually I can't even I can't even think what it's going to be like, but it's not going to be a structure that we're used to now. If we don't actually change things in some way now, then it's going to be a really really um, I don't know difficult. Yeah, sorry, I'm obviously losing my words because it actually makes me it makes me feel really quite deeply that yeah I'm very worried about it. But the point about the 200 groups is that they're building up resilience 
because we need to build up resilience because if the government doesn't do anything then it's just going to get worse and and actually the most important thing in life is love quite frankly and we need to be building these these relationships and and yeah common grounds essentially we're not all hippies <laughs> okay yeah, well that's, that's, yeah, that sounds like a good point to throw it out to to you so i think there is a roving microphone is it over there great so questions we're doing questions we're definitely doing questions this is the, this is the best bit okay um lady here in the white shirt with uh, her hand up There's a microphone that's, that's coming up, but we'll come to you, so don't worry. Is that a working mic? Oh, uh, thank you for the film. Really interesting. I just had a few concerns. Apart from the fact that it does appear to be aimed at young men, there was just very few women in those films. But also the thing that was, I know you said at the beginning, so that all of these things have kind of like gone tits up in, in lots of them, you know, Syria, Ukraine, and so on and so on. And that seems to me a big gap in the, in the theory, is that so after you've disrupted the dictatorship, what do you do next? And, and, and I want to know what your ideas are around that. And I'm just sort of saying, I was going to be really terrible in 20 years' time. It's not enough for me. I want to know what we can actually do. You don't have to disrupt me or tell me that it's important at all. I know that. I want to do what we do next. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah, this is, this is the number one question that we got asked when we went on, on tour with, with the film. Um, and so I know exactly what, what Gene would say of this, because he was sitting beside me um, for so many of these of these screenings and what he said was uh, I spent my entire life going into history finding out what worked and what didn't work and this thing changing a government changing a dictator um, and, and now it's moved on something different is a really difficult thing to do and and what he felt was that his part was to get the this huge rock just moving just a bit to show people how it could be done now my analysis of of this is that uh, the governments in in these cases were shaken in some cases they were changed Tunisia Serbia was probably the best example of this what he said about the next bit when people said yeah but you, you know it didn't work out what was the democracy building you know the parties failed and he said honestly I only have one lifetime that's for you millions of pounds of funding go into democracy building organizations of, of what happens next I can't do that bit but in adopting non-violent action as the means of change you're already halfway there you're already in a better position to build uh, a successful democratic uh, um, country than you would have been if you'd gone straight to violence or if you've just been pass passive because this is the biggest attack line um, if if you discount non-violence and you say it doesn't work what is the alternative? I haven't discounted it. No, no, I'm not what, saying about you. What's next? No, what's yeah, next? I'm not. I'm not saying about this. What? Is this is about you? What I'm saying is that he identified this this part of the work to change a, change a government. Now, if you're not killing the person in the in the community that you're against, and you're working together, you're devolving power into local communities, you're decentralising power, you're working together, you're working on constructive programs that means your society is already mobilizing in a way which should be more conducive to coming together after a change than it would have been had you not been doing that before and remember the alternative is doing nothing because it's too scary or going direct direct to violence people often say oh well non-violence non-violence failed let's not do that again let's go straight to violence but no one ever says that about war no one ever fights a battle or does a terrorist campaign and says, oh, that didn't work. Let's, let's not go to military warfare anymore. Um, so that's his, that's his response. That might not be enough for you, but that's what he said. So I'm going to just add one tiny thing, which is um, that Eric, the work of Erica Chenoweth is a huge influence on our movement in particular. I thoroughly recommend if you get a chance to read that as well, which basically statistically builds on the work of Jean Sharp. She analysed every single conflict, armed and unarmed, uh, well, or violent, non-violent, in the 20th century, and the statistics are astonishing. And it is, uh, the, the headline figure is, violent struggle gets success 26% of the time, non-violent struggle 53% of the time. So whilst we can feel pretty depressed right now, we should remember that it is still the better option, and not from a moral point of view, but simply from a practical success point of view.
you're going to say about what happens next, I guess. A bit. Yeah. Well, just, I mean, very quickly, I mean, we, you know, in Extinction Rebellion, we have a specific ask, which is to upgrade democracy. We're specifically asking for a citizen's assembly, which is something that was used, obviously, very successfully in Ireland as a route through the abortion crisis. And so that would be our answer to what happens next. And obviously, I won't kind of bore you with the details right now, but it is an incredibly solid, incredibly exciting opportunity to get us out of the mess that we are in right now, not just with our climate crisis, but with a hell of a lot more in our politics right now. So we really advocate that. Okay, ladies, just here. Yes, and is this thing working? In the United States, there's massive health information censorship going on right now. My documentary was removed from Amazon Prime at the request of Congress. Facebook, Google, Pinterest, Etsy, TED Techs, they're all censoring on this. And once we get 5G and they're going to be able to monitor every movement every second. I, and most people are asleep. They don't realize this is coming, but it's going to, it looks like it's going to an end that's going to be very unpleasant for all of us. I just want to put that out there. Any way to collaborate? Any comments? Just want to collaborate. Um, I think uh, movements go in sort of waves. With the, with, in 2011, Twitter was pretty young. Um, social media was used in a way against these governments that they hadn't really expected. The, that mobilization overwhelmed them. They really didn't have the people um, in government who, who, who knew how to fight back. What you, learn, what you see happen afterwards is actually the people had the edge with social media in 2011 and they used it. And then immediately these d dictatorships start <coughs> realize the power that was being mobili mobilized against them and then they stole it back. So now Facebook is kind of used against us really these and now we're in a new phase where democracy activists activists of all climate activists of all types against multinationals um have got to build something new to get out of it so for instance in hong kong and china i know for instance that they don't trust systems anymore so they're going back to pieces of paper under doors in the serbian case study the internet was very young. The internet penetration in that country was, was next to nothing. They were still going through the phone book and phoning people up. You know, they weren't sending tweets, but they still managed to be effective um, in the analog field. It may be that we have to go, go analog uh, to get back the advantage. And because the advantage that we have as activists is that you're normally a bit faster to react um, and, and innovative. Um, and it's all about building that new media pillar. I have confidence that new systems will be built. The biggest threat, I think, to us is artificial intelligence. The weaponization of big states, authoritarian states, against people that they know everything about us. Our, our faces are recognizable. That could be teamed up with our data. They can know what we're looking at instantly at Google. They can pick out someone who will become an activist before they even realize they're going to become an activist. That's scary. Uh, we need to find people who can build AI which can be put into the use of the democratic forces. And I also just think that is like it's really testament to why local groups and us communicating within our communities about um, about the truth. I mean we talk a lot about telling the truth in Extinction Rebellion because it's, it's what we're here to do. Um, it's getting the people around you to feel that critically analyzing the situation that they're in and everything that they come into contact with every day is actually the most Im the most important shield it's the most it's the most powerful shield and the most um i think important survival tactic actually it's just being aware and being critically yeah analytical of everything around you so um the more we grow as a movement um, not just Extinction Rebellion, but the movement of people who are questioning the current democratic system and questioning the influences that, um, you know, fossil fuel money has on essentially changing the way that media messages are communicated. We've just got to be aware. So it's just growing that awareness. And that's really what we're here to do. Just a final quick note on that. 
non-violent struggle, people often forget that there are acts of commission where you do something, but there are also acts of omission. Um, and that is just withdrawal from Facebook, withdrawal from sort of platforms that, you, you, that are not respecting your privacy, and maybe that we need to do. And that's easier to, to get people to do. So, so sometimes I see sort of reporting, and you know, I'm a BBC journalist, and I, I see my, my own reporters at journalism, and I think, oh, that's not quite right. So one of those examples was in Ve Venezuela, one of our reporters was standing there and saying, you know, we're waiting for, the people are waiting for the army to step in and help the people. And I just thought, well, you, actually the army don't need to do anything. The, the army just needs to not do anything and let the people take control and not shoot the protesters. That's all, that, all they needed to do was stay neutral. And it's easier to get the army or the police to do nothing than it is to get them to do something. Um, and so important to identify acts of omission as well as commission. Hi, uh, thank you for showing this film and for being here. It's been really interesting. Um, what I, g I guess one of the things that struck me while watching the film was this information has now been around for a long time, and it's started with groups who, like you, like as the film's shown, has um, been there to combat dictatorships. We're seeing now activism in general throughout the world is coming up in different forms. How do, what does one group of activists using this information counter another group of activists, an opposing group of activists who are trying to use the same tactics? And how do you, like is there, are there further ways to kind of take this, these strategies and kind of evolve for kind of the modern era like with dis disinformation and stuff like that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, I didn't. I didn't really mention that Gene, although he looks really not um, very well in, in that in, in the film. You know, he actually only passed away um, two years ago. Um, and uh, I used to. I, I've just completed his biography, and I used to go and sit with him uh, quite often and just talk to him. And and one of the biggest things I talked to him about was that was this idea. Um, he always had the idea that we would go to non-violent warfare um, as, a, as a means of warfare. So he, what he wasn't trying to do was take away conflict, which is why the traditional peace lobby didn't really get on with him. Um, they didn't, he, he wasn't like peace and love. He said, he, it's a natural thing for humans to be in conflict, but what I want to do is replace the, the tools of conflict with non-violent conflict. So effectively, it becomes a sort of game of chess between two sides. Now, there's a lot of evidence that shows that the Russians have actually used Gene Sharp's work against the Americans now. Now, if you look at the 2016 election, what were the Russians doing? They were funding nonviolent groups. They were propagating through them through Facebook. They were attacking the, millers of, mi mi the pillars of support. They were using dif di disinformation campaigns. These were the tactics that we had played against them in, in their or orbit um, of operations. And I would say that that's probably an example of the first sort of non-violent war, a la Gene Sharp. And the far right is now catching on and using this as well. Um, so this is why it's so important to study. There's another page in that book um, that says, you know, put, put back down your books, it's time, you know, stop reading. Never stop reading. There are non-violent actions taking place all over the world right now. We should be learning from all of them because at this point in time, we're learning so much. Whenever the Chinese do something, we need to know about it because it'll be used somewhere else. When the Russians do something, the Syrians use it because that th those allies in, in dictatorships or authoritarian regimes of multinational companies too are sharing information on how to defuse this type of power. In Hong Kong right now, you'll see people breaking windows, um, you see how easy it was for the um, the uh, Chinese media to say come into the come into the parliament. Now, sitting on a foreign desk at the BBC, uh, I couldn't believe how easy that was. But the Chinese wanted you to see how much damage those protesters had done. They want you to see someone beating up someone in the street. A lot of those, I believe, probably are agent provocateurs. That's the media war that's going on now. Um, so it's about fighting that and having some people really studying this, really knowing how it's going, because 
I tell you what, more screenings of How to Start a Revolution have happened in military defence colleges and special warfare units, and I mean in this country and in UK and in China, than have probably gone to P to peace units. So anyway, I've been getting the chop now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory. We're just so grateful. I'd just like to say thank you so much for um, uh, Curzon and Doc House for doing the screening. It's been amazing. Been thank you, thank you. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>